Hi, I'm Mike going to the In Groove in Phoenix, Arizona. Today I'm going to show you what I got and tell you about my recent trip to the Netherlands in Den Bosch, the largest record fair in the entire world. I went in 2015 as well. That was held in Utrecht. I will uh, kind of tell you about what I got and also my trip and my experiences there. What's different from the last show to this show? One of the main differences for me was I set up to sell at this show as well. But let's start with the trip, starting from the very beginning of the trip. The plane ride over there. I was not feeling good all day. Sometimes, you know, I'm not a huge fan of flying, although I do it. But, you know, I always get a little nervous on takeoff, landing. Uh, and, you know, turbulence kind of bothers me a little bit. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of heights in general, so, you know. But I, I do it. I do it all the time. Uh, but that particular day, I just felt really bad, and I was just... You know, we were stuck in the plane for a little while, taking off. It was a little bit of a delay. And I had to go to the bathroom really bad. And I was, you know, holding it. Uh, but, you know, I was trying to get in the air, but I just couldn't do it. So we're sitting on the tarmac, flight attendant, you know, they say we're next in line to take off. And I just made the decision that I was either going to have to uh, soil myself or go to the bathroom. So right before takeoff, I ran into the bathroom, got in the bathroom right as I sat down on the John. They hit the, uh, they hit the, they hit the gas. So I'm sitting on the, on the John. My head is banging, you know, a little tiny John, of course, in the bathroom. My head is banging onto the plastic wall because we're going 200 miles an hour as I'm sitting there with my, you know, my underwear is around my legs. And my head is bouncing off of the wall. Then the John itself broke. You know, when you flush a toilet and it has that suck, you know, that. Well, it was permanently on. Sorry to be so graphic, but this is kind of sets the tone for how the, the trip went. So it's permanently sucking. Now, I couldn't exactly leave because, you know, you're taking off. I'm, you know, I guess you could walk around a plane as you're first taking off, but it, you know, didn't seem like a smart move. So I just was, you know, hanging out in the bathroom. Uh, a little bit nervous, I gotta admit. I was a little bit nervous. I don't know what happens when you run to the bathroom when you're supposed to be buckled in. So I'm thinking to myself, what happens? Am I going to get like, uh, you know, yelled at by a flight attendant? What's going to happen? I have no idea. So, you know, heard the captain come on and say, you can uh, take your seatbelts off now. I just hopped out of the bathroom and sat down, pretend like nothing ever happened. Nobody said anything. Except my buddy Johnny D, who I went with the show. You know, I've done a couple of live streams with Johnny. I did, uh, you know, his label, Ramco, owns the Wild Times. I did the uh, a couple live streams with him, and I talked about him on the Wild Times release quite a few times. But we went to the trip together. It was me, Johnny, and uh, one of my daughters. So we did the show together. So he kind of, you know, made fun of me a little bit. But I told him, like, hey, it's a long trip to Georgia. I had to go to the bathroom. I had to go to the bathroom. So get to Georgia. Get stuck again hour and a half we had to sit on the tarmac just to take off there was winds or turb you know something was going on who knows they didn't have a pilot that seems to be the issue going around in the united states lack of pilots but we got stuck there it was a weird flight to begin with because at nine o'clock in the morning is when this all you know we left it was a 15 hour trip with the delay in georgia so it was nine o'clock and i think it was like right around the time we got to Schiphol in the netherlands amsterdam it was like nine at night so it's like an eerie Twilight Zone type of situation, or Groundhog Day, like, you know, to where the day starts all over again. But in this case, I didn't actually get to go to sleep. It's like the day just started over again when I landed. But, you know, in the past, when I've gone, it's not... Utrecht was a fantastic city for that record show for a few reasons. One, the show is, like, minutes from the train station. You know, and there's really not... You know, you'll find in the Netherlands, the taxis, cars in general are not very well adopted. They're bike and walking type people. So, Utrecht, great, you know, bigger city than Den Bosch, 
more restaurants, real cl hotels real close to the train station, you know, it's a shorter ride. It's like 25, 30 minutes from the airport versus Den Bosch, which is about an hour. Uh, and, you know, I, the transportation and infrastructure in Utrecht in 2015 was significantly better than Den Bosch. So we get off the train and we had to walk to our hotel because, you know, it was only like eight or nine minutes. Johnny, who's, you know, 70s, he was dying. You know, granted, we had some suitcases, but he's like humping these suitcases down to cobblestone and he's yelling at me the whole time. We need a taxi. I'm like, I can see the hotel. How are we going to get a taxi? It's right there. What are we going to tell the taxi driver? Please take us 200 yards that way. I'm like, we got to walk. We got to walk. So we got there. We went there. We fell, you know, hopped in bed, fell asleep. Uh, you know, for a couple hours, I think we got up. Or no, we didn't go right to sleep, I don't think. I think we went and got food and then went to sleep. Uh, we went to a place called The Bear. I think it's a, somebody told me it was a chain. The best thing about the Netherlands are the people. are absolutely fantastic. Uh, they're very friendly. They're very talkative. Uh, I don't know if because, you know, being an American, maybe it's like we're an anomaly to them. But I feel like they're probably just, the Dutch are just probably naturally friendly people. And you will have conversations you know, eating out over in Europe, if for you, you know, a lot of you guys I'm talking to are from there. So, you know, because I get people around the world that watch this. But if you haven't been out of the country, a meal in the United States is they get you in very quick and they get you out the door very quick. No chit-chatting. You know, waiters want to get tips. Restaurants, it's all about turning over that table as quick as possible. That's not the case in Europe. It is like you want to sit there for two and a half hours and just chat away. No problem. But the people are very, very friendly. I always have a blast when I go. Uh, the weather for me, though, personally, is absolutely atrocious. Uh, ice cold, you know. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, born and raised in Florida. So I like the heat. It's like 38 degrees. But I love the Dutch people, and I continue to go because the experience and the records and the people is worth it every single time. And then I, like, think to myself when I'm out of there. I'm like, oh my god, why did I do this? It's so cold. I'm so cold. Then time goes on and I want to do it again. But uh, I was supposed to meet somebody there for, normally when I go there, I got a guy I meet and he's a record buyer from Europe that goes to the States. So we trade euros for dollars. That fell through. So I went there and I didn't even have any euros. So that's kind of how the show started. We got to the show early in the morning. Everybody's a little bit frantic because there is no... Uh, organization like there had been i mean this show was really well organized but there was no that the familiarity wasn't there of i've been here for 30 years this is where my table is this is how everything's done because it was a brand new building unfortunately i was by this like giant roll-up door and i was absolutely just dying i mean that wind was coming in i was freezing uh then I didn't have any euros. I went to the ATM. I got a couple of hundred euros. And the very first couple of things I bought, I'll show you here. I think I got maybe these couple of records. You know, I found these at a dealer relatively cheap. You know, you some UK, you know, I found a guy that had these for 10 euros a piece. Music for films, 10 euros a piece. I found this for like 10 euros. Uh, it's a boxed Deca label, but, you know, real clean out of our heads, right? Then I found these Tracy Chapmans. This is a tough album to get in the States. I think I got maybe three of these. I think I might have sold one already, but I got these Tracy Chapmans for like 10 euros. And then I found this first European press of Nirvana Nevermind. Okay, so I'm tapped out. I'm out of money. I'm walking around. There's all kinds of stuff I want to buy. The feeding frenzy is going crazy. And again, I'm going to show you guys in a couple of days video of me walking around buying stuff. Give you guys an idea of the scope and what's there. So I ended up having to go to a money exchange. That was like a half hour walk, half hour walk back. This is day one. I hadn't figured quite out how to get a taxi at this point in time. But Johnny wasn't having any more of walking in Den Bosch. It was, we had to get a taxi. So we found the taxi, but I'll tell you about that later. So we did some buying and uh, that's, you know, I bought, I bought, 
luckily the event organizer put me in a different spot. I didn't ask. She just said, Hey, I got some tables, some people that didn't show up. I'm in a movie. I'm like, fantastic. Is it away from that big giant door? Cause I'm freezing over here. So she moved me. Everything was great. So I went to the exchange and I came back, but I gotta say, so a few things have changed since the show has moved from Utrecht to Den to Den Bosch. One of the things is Brexit. So when I talked to some British dealers there, the Brits can no longer just load up their vehicle and drive to the show. Now they have to go through customs. One guy told me he brought a truckload there for the last show. It was like 7,000 pounds in customs. They went to the show. The show was canceled the day before. They drove back and it was like five or 6,000 pounds to get it back there. Now I don't know the inner workings of how the customs work there, but that's highly preventative from driving over to the record show shows. So as a US dealer, a lot of the stuff I'm typically looking for are the UK pressings. There were some there, you saw some there, but those giant British dealers that have, you know, 50 foot of table space weren't there. So that was kind of a bummer for me. Also, as a dealer, somebody that was setting up because of the Ukraine war, uh, the last time I was at that show, some of the fiercest buyers that were there were the Russians. They were buying like crazy all over there. There was groups of Russian buyers and also Japanese buyers who at this show, again, weren't present. Maybe COVID related. I'm not 100% sure. So it's kind of, you know, for me, it was a little bit of a bummer because the show wasn't like it was in 2015 that I remember. But I go for the experience. I wasn't worried about it. I went to the, you know, to the money man, got a pocket full of euros and I went on and I started buying more records. And most of this stuff I got in day one. So let's show you what else I got. I found some pretty cheap UK pressings of Roxy Music. Found a couple of these. Pretty cheap. You know, not first pressings, but like early 70s, late 60s. Uh, what is this? That's maybe 70, 71. UK pressings of uh, Saucer Full of Secrets. Reasonable. I found really nice. I mean, anytime I could find real clean European pressings of Dark Side of the Moon and reasonable price, I buy them. That was, uh, you know, maybe 10, 10 euros. But I mean, they're not everywhere. These deals you kind of have to root for, you know, you're going to dig. These I got pretty reasonable. Uh, this is a repress, UK repress, you know little later pressing of one of my favorite albums of all time, L.A. Woman. German pressing of L.A. Woman. You know, nice and clean. This is after I, uh, you know, uh, made my way over to the exchange. I bought two of these. Sold one already. UK, A2, B2, first pressing. Extremely clean vinyl. Uh, the last one played wonderful. Listen to it when I got back. This one is going to be another pretty solid play copy. I mean, the vinyl on these are like EX near mint. I mean, there's a few marks on this, but nothing feelable. And they're just like, you know, wispy marks that are more like uh, from putting it in and out of the jacket more than likely. But I'll put this on the website. A2B2, winner of my shootout for the best sounding version of Dark Side of the Moon. And they were both, I bought two copies. Both were complete posters, uh, both posters, both stickers, as was that one. But I don't have the other one to show you because I sold it already. The first time I went, I would find these German vertigos everywhere. Part of it now too, guys, is everybody's after vinyl these days. So I had a difficult time, but I found a couple of pet Black Sabbath related titles. Master Reality, German Vertigo, Gold Label, German Door Self Title. Found this pretty cheap. Some Scorpions, The Smiths, much more desirable in the US than over there. That was a Portugal pressing. Found a couple, probably a couple of these. Wish you were here. This is a Holland pressing. You find a lot of that over there now that you don't have the British dealers there in force like before. Again, I'm always going to pick up early 70s UK Pink Floyd titles. 
David Bowie Diamond Dogs. This is an earlier Holland pressing. So that was pretty much all I was able to find on day one. Now day two, I set up mostly, you know, I stayed at the table the most of the time. A lot of people were coming by, you know, meeting people, uh, talking about the wild times, me and Johnny D. And also we were, you know, I was kind of gauging to see how if I, you know, I thought about maybe doing the show in the future and whatnot. I'm still not sure if I want to do it, and you know, as a full, because... I have the ability to mail stuff over there. I might do it in the future. I'm not 100% sure. I really, truly enjoy it. It's such a different experience than living in the United States. So I truly love it over there. So maybe I'll make an excuse to go out there again. You know, it's kind of, for me, it's like a vacation. As far as buying records, you know, it is a unique, and I'll show you in the next video. It's a unique place because there's very... You know, as a U.S. buyer, you're going to see stuff over there that you'll never see in the United States. And you don't just see it once. You know, you'll drive, you'll see like Vertigo Holy Grails and you'll see them like 15 times over. I mean, you won't just see one copy, you'll see multiple copies. Like that A2, B2, Dark Side of the Moon. I mean, I saw like 15 or 20 copies. Most of them were unreasonably priced. Uh, but you'll see, I mean, where are you going to go to a record show and see 20 copies of that record? You know, where are you going to go to a record show and see 10, 20 copies of Turquoise Led Zeppelins or, you know, 10 copies of Ben on Vertigo? I mean, you're just not going to find that kind of firepower at any other show in the world. Now, if you're looking for like American Psych, American Jazz, American Blues, that's not the kind of stuff you find at this show. That's more of what you're going to find at the Austin Record Show. But even that's become difficult because nowadays in the modern times, people just sell everything online. So... Yeah, one thing I tried to do, my hardest not to do is sell everything on eBay, Discogs. I try to keep as much as possible the good stuff in the record store. All this stuff's actually going to go out uh, the day after I film this video. So today, for you guys watching it, throw this in the bins and online. So day one, did some buying. That's kind of the dealer setup day. Day two, hung out at the booth, had a great time. Again, love the Dutch people. Love meeting all the people. That was a ton of fun. So day two, there was a guy that I got pretty friendly with. He is a French dealer, and he kind of specializes in Nigerian funk, Afrobeat stuff, a little bit of high life. But he uh, got to his table, and you know, I you know he had very reasonable price stuff, very reasonable price stuff. So I started finding some stuff. Figured I'd give it a try, you know. It, this is probably more specialty stuff for DJs and whatnot, but nobody else in Arizona has this stuff, so I figured I'd grab some. So let me show you some of the Nigerian stuff I bought. This was pretty much what I bought. This was, excuse me, this is Sunday, the last show. Most of it was Nigerian pressings. And if you're familiar with, like, you know, South African records, this is typically your average condition South African record. To where the cover is disintegrating and the disc i don't know if that translates on the camera but this is like maybe on a good day this would be considered a g record but finding records like this from nigeria that look like mobile fidelity freshly pressed records that don't exist and probably sealed they came out looking vg they don't exist in that condition so most of those buyers for this kind of music understand that some of this stuff's fantastic. I've listened to it. And it's like, God, I hate to get rid of some of it. But I want to see how it does in the store. This is Yvonne Chaka Chaka. Just kind of run through some of this stuff. You can get an idea. Love is Fair. Black Children Sledge Funk Group. I mean, come on. Doesn't that just... Look at that photo. This is like... Play Me. <laughs> Written all over it. Looks awesome. All right, patience. Most of the stuff I got was like, you know, Afro funk. I did get get a few high life pieces. You know, what is this? Getting on, getting down. So we'll try this out. I'll put it in my world section. We'll see how it does. 
It's not like anybody else in Arizona has this. You're not going to walk into a record store and find this stuff, that's for sure. But this kind of this kind of made my Sunday. And this all led up to, after I made the deal on this stuff, he popped something out that's kind of been on my want list for a very, very, very long time. But me personally, I do not buy, and although I do have some Nigerian records in my collection that look like this, because that's the only way you can get them, because the modern represses just sound worse than these G plus records because they just source them from G plus records, digitize them and make them even worse. But he had a record that was on my, my want list for a very, very, very long time. And I'll show you that in a minute, almost to it. Pull all these out. So, run through these. What is that? Christy. Put the price tag over the name. Sir Steady Arobi. Amandu Blake. Balaki. Sorry. Looks pretty good. Taxi Man. What is this? I'll just show them to you. No sense in me just butchering every one of these names. It's not like you'll be able to Google it off of me telling you what their name is anyways. Gone Bye Bye. Looks pretty good. Where was that made? That's actually a French pressing. Ooh, look at the condition on this. But it looks good, don't it? Kenya Superstars of Africa. Kenga Superstars of Africa? <laughs> not even close. It's hard to make out with the uh, font there. I can go super stars of Africa. Chris MBA. This looks really good. Tony Gray. <coughs> My message. <coughs> really cool cover. Looks good. Looks funky. And Chris MBA again. Okay, so I figured let's try something new. We'll bring back some Nigerian funk to Phoenix. So then he goes, the dealer at the end, pulls out this LP mail or has some like sticker on it. Do not touch like skulls and crossbones. Don't touch, you know, something along those lines. And what's he pull out? He pulls out a heavy. Look at that. Malatu of Ethiopia. This is an unbelievably killer record. I had the repress that they did a couple of years back. Uh, fantastic. He played the vibes. He played other instruments. He did this on Worthy. This was out of New York. After this record, I believe he went back to Ethiopia and his other albums were Ethiopian releases. But this he did in the U.S. But look at this copy. This is not a record that you find in this condition. He had this record. This puppy is in the shrink. This was a mint record. He told me he actually opened it, played it a couple of times, and shelved it in this elaborate cardboard box with the skull and crossbones and the, you know, don't touch message on it. But you could check this out online. He was, like I said, vibe player. It has kind of that 70s... Revo, reverb drenched funk sound to it but it's fantastic it's a little avant-garde but not really it's kind of an avant-garde funky you know ethiopian jazz record it's fantastic i don't really know how to describe it other than that but just look at that cover and again there's a re couple reissues of this and it's also on like the streaming sites online so I bought this on Sunday and this just made my day. Okay, so now you get towards the end of the show. And now this is when dealers are discounting stuff pretty severely because they want to uh, carry less stuff home. So I'm digging and it's harder to find this because that's when everybody really picks through everything. But I found a few things. Found this uh, monocopy on the yellow and parlophone label of, you know, UK pressing of Sgt. Pepper. Pretty clear. I think it was like, I don't know, 80 
80 euros and it was discounted half off or something. And I picked it up. Not bad, right? So I'm digging through somebody's like five euro budget box and I find this. And I'm like, well, five euros. And I'm like, that's either the cleanest copy of the Stefan Wolf record in existence or it's the analog productions repress. It was the analog productions repress. And I think it was five euros, but it was half off. So I got this for $2.50 in Den Bosch. The analog productions, yeah, you can see on the vinyl, and it's a mint record. This was untouched. The analog productions version of Steppenwolf. And you can see the job that Analog Productions did on this cover is just next level. They replicated the original, but it's on heavy duty cardboard, you know, typical tip on jacket that you get from them. But this was kind of like this, you know, the best budget score, I guess, of the show. And then the last couple of things I got was a couple copies of the wall. I got a UK pressing and a Dutch pressing. So UK, and I got these actually for like, 10 euros a piece. So there was deals to be found there, but they were, you know, the size and the scope of the show. Check out my future video and I'll show you that. It's a little bit harder to find those deals. You know, you got to kind of like dig around for it. So the one weirdest thing about the entire trip. So we finally got the hotel to call us a taxi, right? So the hotel calls us a taxi. The guy shows up in a Tesla Model X wearing... Louis Vuitton belts, Louis Vuitton belt, Gucci pants. He had like Balenciagas or Prada shoes on. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is going on? How much do the taxi tribe, taxi tri cab drivers in this country make? Well, it's, we're thinking it has to be fluky. They call us somebody else the next day. They show up in a nice Mercedes, but rather than wearing, you know, they were wearing like you know, Balenciagas and Gucci jacket with Louis Vuitton. I mean, the taxi cab drivers all dressed like, you know, Russian gangsters or mobsters. It was just absolutely wild what they were wearing. It was just, it became like a reoccurring game. Like, you know, can we guess what three designer pieces of clothing our taxi cab driver was going to show up with uh, today? But yeah, it was, you know, Mercedes, and Teslas, and thousands of dollars in clothing on every one of these taxi cab drivers. It was really uniquely wild, I'm telling you. And I think the, you know, the taxi ride wasn't cheap. It was like 20 euros, but, you know, and it wasn't fake stuff either, which is, you know, you can tell certain things are faked, but then certain things are, I don't know. I know that not every, you know, they weren't wearing fake stuff. These guys had, I don't know what they were doing, you know. Maybe it was some, like, side, you know. Johnny kept saying, what is going on here? You know, he's, like, paranoid that this was, like, a front for, like, money laundering. Or the taxi cab drivers were going to, like, sell us into slavery. And I'm like, Johnny, you're old and I'm middle-aged, fat, and bald. Nobody's selling us into slavery, I promise. We're pretty worthless unless they need somebody to, like... Cater, you know, unless they need somebody to be a curator of their record collection, we're not going to be very useful to them. But yeah, that was it. I mean, I had a blast doing it. I have the idea maybe of setting up in the future. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I just don't know. Uh, there's so much going on here in the United States. I've got, we moved into the new building. Business is booming. Uh, it's very difficult to get away, you know, and I had to leave Angel here to watch a store. She kind of didn't like that, me off in the Netherlands, because she loves it over there, too. Uh, you know, we went to Amsterdam. We did a trip in Amsterdam, walking around. I've did it a few times in the past, but that's a ton of fun. Uh, it's, you know, I gotta say, the more, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but the more I shop in record stores around the world... When I get back to mine, I'm like, you know what? I built something pretty awesome here. And that was always my main goal as a record collector. Uh, I wanted to build a record store that I could shop in, that I, you know, and I got pretty high standards. I wanted it to be something that I would enjoy shopping in, where there was cool stuff everywhere. And I don't know, maybe I'm patting myself on the back a little bit, but I kind of felt you know, every time I come back into town after going to other record stores, 
I'm happy. You know, the In Groove is, I mean, if you're ever in town, come to the In Groove. It's a fantastic record store. But yeah, that's enough of that. Check us out online, www.theingroove.com. Until next time.